Back in the 90s, before creepypastas on the internet were easily available, there was beyond belief fact or fiction to get our paranormal fix. If you haven't watched it, then here's how it went. There were five stories in each episode and the viewer had to discern which was fact and which was fiction. At the end of the show, the presenter, which was James Brolin for the first season and Jonathan Frakes for two, three and four, would reveal the correct answer. Very often, the ones that seemed to be fake were not and vice versa. After recently re-watching, I decided to compile some top 10 lists from the show that really are beyond belief. This is the top 10 of paranormal stories that were revealed as fact, but really are not that unbelievable and could easily have been not such a fantastical explanation. At number 10 is the story of a lady, probably in her late 30s, early 40s. She is always a bridesmaid and never the bride. We see her at her younger and quite stunning looking sister's wedding, pensively wishing it was her. Anyway, fast forward a couple of years and her sister's hubby disappears in a boating accident and is presumed dead. Our subject has just discovered internet dating and has connected with this guy and is going really well. They arrange to meet. However, when she arrives at the bar, she is confronted with her brother-in-law, the one whom her sister is grieving for. Despite what we are thinking, it turns out he has amnesia and no recollection of his life prior to the accident. Or at least that's his story and he's sticking to it. He and his wife are reunited and live happily ever after, while the other lady is forever a spinster. What is the most surprising part of the story to me is that happily ever after actually exists or that being single is portrayed as something negative. I'd far rather be single and fabulous than stuck with some guy with a dubious excuse for bailing first time round. Giving him the benefit of the doubt though, there are a large number of people who do suffer amnesia from a trauma, but the majority do recover and do not erase their past completely. At number nine is the story of the prescription. An older man has ran his pharmacy for many years. He knows most of his customers and their medications by heart. His grandson has just qualified and joins him in the business, but has notions of bringing it into the modern era with a more organised, efficient way of doing things, much to the old man's disdain. The young guy has been left in charge and is in the process of transferring everything to the computer when a regular drops in with her script. He sticks the paper script onto a board and goes to fill it. He turns around to check the dosage, only to discover it isn't there. The old man returns and he can't find it either, but he feels that the dosage his grandson remembers being on the script is wrong. After a short exchange, the old man calls the doctor to discover that the dosage of the script was wrong. It should have been one milligram, not 10 milligrams, and had it been dispensed, it could have been fatal for the patient. At this point, the script reappears, creating that beyond belief moment. Now, misplacing a script in a pharmacy really isn't that odd. I'm sure it happens a lot. Indeed, medical mistakes by doctors is fairly commonplace too, with thousands of malpractice cases every year. I really do question the accuracy of the story, though, as the medication Equiset doesn't even come in as low a dosage as one milligram. And it seems really unlikely a tablet that is normally dispensed in 40 milligrams would kill someone if they took 10 milligrams. At number eight is the tale of the twins. So we have twin sisters in their teens. Apparently, they feel each other's emotions and also each other's physical pain, which kind of sounds awful, to be honest. One body to feel pain in is quite enough. So one night, one of the sisters is going to a party. The other has a band and has recently recorded a CD. On her way to the party, she grabs her sister's CD to play in the car. Sometime later... A brother and the girl who stayed home both hear music, even though they are watching sport on TV. It's the CD, but as there's only one copy and it's in the car, they wonder how. Next, we see her curling up in pain, crying that something has happened to her twin. The brother takes his car along the route to the party, and sure enough, we find that the girl has been in a car wreck. Apparently, this telepathy of sorts has saved her life, and the clip ends with both girls going off in the ambulance. Telepathy between twins is widely reported, more so in identical twins than fraternal. However, there is no supporting medical evidence to give it credibility. What is unusual here is that the brother, for the first and only time, also seemed to tap into the connection, having heard the music also. At number seven, we have the game of ghostly chess. A man and his friend play chess weekly. On his way home from the weekly game, he dies in a car wreck. The remaining man is very lonely and misses his friend, so to cheer him up, his wife offers to play a game with him. When she sits down, the pieces begin to move by themselves, which freaks them out and they put the board away. 
They also get the scent of a clone worn by the deceased man. After a paranormal investigation shows up nothing, they do the same, only this time they embrace it. And just as in life, the weekly game of chess becomes a thing, only with his opponent a ghost. Now, I was unable to find any actual information on this particular story, as with many of the stories on Beyond Belief, as they were said to be based on newspaper clippings documented by author Robert Trelands before the internet. But I did find a similar story, only it was not the pieces moving by themselves. It was a medium called Robert Rowland, who did not know how to play the game, but was utilised to play on behalf of the ghost. Number six is another medical anecdote. This time it's a phrenology headset have been owned by Freud. I'm not exactly sure what its original purpose was, but it seems to map out parts of the brain in sections. A neurologist receives this as a gift from his wife. He is quite distracted as he is about to undertake a complicated surgery on a brain tumour that has shown up in the MRI of a young mother. Over the course of the day, a black fingerprint keeps appearing on the head, and despite wiping it off, it reappears. Perplexed, the doctor checks on where the black mark is appearing, and it is the section on which he's about to operate. He takes this as a supernatural sign and rechecks the MRI, only to find that the scans have been mixed up and that said girl is perfectly healthy. I mean, honestly, could it just be the case that he wanted to be sure rechecking the scan as the type of tumour she had was unusual in a young person? Maybe the mark was a coincidence and that whatever he used to wipe it off wasn't removing it properly. I feel this is definitely easily explained and debunked as having a beyond belief cause. At number five is the transplant. This lady got a cornea transplant from a murdered nurse. I wasn't even aware you get an eye transplant, but apparently you can. Anyway, she takes a trip to a bar to celebrate her new vision. And while at the bar, she notices a shady looking man. And she can't take her eyes off him, but not in a good way. He makes her feel very anxious. He confronts her about staring at him and she apologises. Straight after he leaves, she takes off too. She's staying at an adjacent hotel. Now, if she's feeling threatened, you'd think she'd hang about a bit to make sure he's gone, but no. He's waiting for her, drags her into the room and ties her up, insisting that she tells him who she is. But when she tells him, he won't believe her. Eventually, he falls asleep. She manages to get free and raise the alarm. The cops arrive and arrest him. Then they tell her he's wanted for the murder of a nurse. And I'm sure you've guessed by now, it's the nurse whose eyes she got. Creepily enough, people who have had transplants have had major changes to their personality, after which they claim has nothing to do with the traumatic event, of which I'm sure a major surgery like that would be, but the traits of the organ donors. In one instance, a lesbian activist was no longer attracted to women, but men, and another man, also featured in Beyond Belief, claimed to be connected to the mind of the man whose blood he received in a transfusion. Number four is the haunted milk jar. A wholesome American country family receive fresh milk from a local farmer weekly. He delivers it in a big metal churn. So this particular day, delivery is due, but there's been a storm and they are unsure if the elderly man will be able to bring it. Next thing you know, the empty churn that is sitting there waiting to be collected blows its top and the lid flies across the room, accompanied by an explosive sound. This repeats several times, resulting in the man of the house throwing it in the back of his pickup truck and driving to the dairy farm, where he is presented with the old farmer collapsed after taking a stroke. Due to the behaviour of the milk churn, his life is saved. There was a case in the UK quite recently of an incident of the same thing happening to a milk churn, and it was discovered on investigation that it was due to a build-up of gases, not a supernatural phenomena. Number three is the portrait. This is pretty creepy. It's about a guy who paints portraits, but when it is completed, the subject dies. The artist seems to have harnessed this ability to provide some kind of euthanasia service to the terminally ill, but is caught short when he paints a beautiful young woman without getting the history. He just assumes, as most of his clients are by referral, that she is ill, when in fact she is perfectly healthy and wants to commit suicide. So devastated is he that he decides to paint his own portrait and is found dead the next day. So again, like many others, I could not find any exact story circulating about this, but it may have been loosely based on an artist in the UK called Robert Lenkiewicz, who was an odd character, keeping an embalmed corpse in his home, doing business only with referred clients, and in the 80s, after painting himself, he faked his own death. It's a stretch to find the association, but it's all I got. At number two is the mysterious fires. So a couple move into a house and small fires start to erupt everywhere. They have their electrics checked and it's all up to standard. Finally, they call in a psychic who tells them it's caused by some kind of negative energy around one of them that's rooted in the past. The guy comes clean and admits to starting a fire in the wild as a child. 
The psychic tells him all will be well now that he's eased his conscience, but it isn't. It continues until finally, with the build-up of insurance claims, the couple move and the house is demolished. Afterwards, one of the investigating police officers find out that it is actually the female who has the history of arson, having spent years in a mental facility for starting fires. It's implied that if she had been the one who confessed, then it would have stopped, and not the more obvious observation that perhaps she simply continued her pattern of behaviour laying fires in the regular way. While researching this, I came across the story of a small village in Sicily called Canetto. This very thing happened there beginning in 2004. Spontaneous combustion, but not in just one house. Hundreds of fires all over the village. It got so bad that everyone was evacuated, and not just once. This happened sporadically for 10 years. Things that shouldn't be flammable, like a mirror, burst into flames. Things burst into flames with no ignition source, right in front of the eyes of authorities. Hundreds of thousands of pounds were spent investigating natural phenomena, power lines, railway tracks and satellite signals, all to no avail. Of course, the paranormal troops were all on it, claiming that it was anything from UFOs to Satan himself. But apart from high frequency readings, all the exorcisms and other rituals changed nothing. Over time, the majority of the residents had fled due to superstitious beliefs or the intrusive nature of all the investigators. But a handful remained. In 2005, a man and his son were arrested for arson, accused of starting the fires, as hidden cameras had been installed and based on catching him starting fires to claim insurance, his phone was tapped. But it's widely thought that he was the fall guy for experts that could not come to a logical conclusion. While there's no doubt they were milking it for maximum financial gain, it would have been impossible for them to start the amount of fires that took place, especially as many were in other people's private homes, and some had started right in front of officials. But here's the thing. There hasn't been any more fires. So was it a psychic phenomena, just like the story portrayed in Beyond Belief? Although that episode was recorded years before Sicily, so it wasn't based on that true life story. Number one is the monster in the closet, so I was totally convinced this was fiction and was gobsmacked at the end of the show when it was revealed to be fact. A boy probably about nine or ten is terrified of a monster in his closet. Everyone thinks he's much too old to be getting on like this. He gets bullied by his siblings and at school. One day they chase him home and try to force him into the closet. In the end, it's his horrible brother who goes in to prove that there's nothing there. He enters as the gang of bullies egg him on. Shortly after, he starts shouting help, but they all laugh, thinking it's a prank. The next thing, the pleading stops, but the child fails to emerge. They open the door, but he's nowhere to be seen. The police are called and they search the entire closet, but he has vanished. This is where the story ends on Beyond Belief, but not where it ended in real life. It's true, authorities were baffled for some time and rumours of the monster spread. But some weeks later, it was discovered that there was a small trapdoor on the roof of the closet where the boy had escaped and ran away. He was living in the attic of a mate. And once again, we discover that the real monsters are human.